Hello, welcome to the Comic Book Commentary. I'm Bo Leidig, and this week we're going to be talking about the final issue in the original Cyber Force miniseries with Cyber Force number four. So let's zoom in and take a closer look. First published in July of 1993, I'd like to start out by saying I am not a fan of this cover, really. Uh, obviously, with all of the chromium on it, it's a real pain to try and film this due to the reflection and what it's picking up in the background. It looks worse on camera than it is in real life, but even in real life, one of the problems that you run into is that because of all the chromium on the side of Stryker's face and his shoulder here, it actually obscures a lot of the line work and detail. And obviously you can't shade with chromium, so you don't get any of the actual you know, shading and definition that you get in the rest of the image. And it just feels like very strange and uh, off-putting, like it doesn't fit. Uh, I don't have a problem with them doing it for the logo or the image logo. I think that's cool. It's a it's a nice little, like, touch. Uh, obviously, keeping in line with the whole, like, cybernetic theme of the characters. But to do it directly on the side of the character's face here just feels like it doesn't work. Also, uh, if you'd like to see what this image looked like without the chromium, they show a preview of it at near the end of issue number three, and it looks so much better. It really does. Like, there's so much more definition. It, it looks like a more cohesive piece of artwork. It just, it flows better. It fits the theme of the work better. And on top of that, you know, if you're going to do something like this with all the chromium on one side, why would you wait until the fourth issue? of the comic book to do it. You would want to do it with the first issue, would be my guess. That's what we saw with, you know, the likes of Deathblow or something like we saw with Union or even Shadowhawk number one. All of those books brought the, the shiny, holofoil, chromium, foil, blah, 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 on their first issue. Whereas Cyberforce, for some reason, waited until the fourth. It just doesn't really make sense. Also, while we're on the topic, if you haven't watched my videos on the first three issues of the miniseries, I do suggest you do so before watching this video because it's going to make this issue make a little bit more sense than it does, but not a lot because there's a lot of weird nonsensical stuff going in, on in this issue that we'll get into. But uh, if you'd like to watch this one, I suggest watching those ones first. You can find them in my Cyberforce playlist. Pencils, Mark Silvestri. Story, Script. Eric Silvestri. Inks, Scott Williams. Colors, Joe Chiodo. Letters, Mike Heisler. Editor, Cynthia Sullivan. Color separations, Ollie Optics. We see here that this issue, of course, picks up exactly where issue three left off. Uh, after the police shot at uh, Mother May I and Warbuck, and they, of course, were subsequently saved by Stryker, who led them inside of the building where they could make their escape. The mutants that were outside of the Red Bay housing projects in Brooklyn started to full-on riot as we see them starting fires and breaking out windows and stealing TVs and whatnot. Uh, this, of course, has garnered lots of media attention as we see a reporter speaking about this. Uh, behind her, we see an image of a police officer chasing a mutant who has stolen a television and she's about to bring on the chief of police. However, Mother May I, who is now in her underground base, which is deep underneath the Red Bay housing projects, along with Warbuck and Stryker, is not interested in hearing what the police chief has to say, as she believes he's just going to give some rhetoric about how he's going to protect the fair citizens of New York from the evil mutant threat, and that they have more important things to worry about right now. Also, something I noticed reading this issue, and it's actually pretty present throughout all of the issues of the miniseries, but for whatever reason, we see that all the members of Cyberforce have pretty much normal human features. Uh, Impact is very large, but he still looks like a person, despite the fact of being completely metalized. Um, everyone else is basically just an average human. I mean, yes, you see that Stryker has three arms on the right side of his body, but we don't know if that was something that was caused by his mutation or if it was an implant that was given to him after the fact when Cyberdata experimented on him. So why I find that strange is because the vast majority of the other mutants 
throughout all of the Cyberforce miniseries are portrayed as being very different in their appearance from a regular everyday human beings. We see that Mother May I obviously has a third eye in the middle of her forehead and blue skin. Warbuck has the head of a deer and a full rack of antlers. Uh, all of the mutants here we see depicted outside of the housing projects all have purple skin and red eyes for some reason, which doesn't really make sense that so many of them would have basically the exact same mutation. This guy down here has three arms. Uh, you know, even what we saw with, you know, like Slam and Splitzkrieg, they don't look human. You know, Splitzkrieg is this giant, super strong, crazy conjoined twin thing. And Slam, you know, looks like some weird little frog type of man almost. It, it, you know, for the most part, Almost all of the mutants are portrayed in very, you know, non-human features in many ways that set them apart. And I'm kind of surprised about that, that so many of them are shown as being, you know, very distinct from an average human being. Even Velocity, who, you know, otherwise looks like a human, she has white skin and like a lightning bolt going down her face which is weird that that would be part of her mutation. I don't know, I just thought it was very interesting that that was the case. We're then teleported to the Cyberdata building where we see that Velocity and Timmy have been apparently recaptured by Cyberdata security, despite the fact that that was not shown anywhere and we didn't get an actual, you know, visual representation of that. They've just been recaptured. And now Velocity is once again feeling depressed that her memory is going to be wiped and she doesn't want to forget Timmy and the members of Cyber Forces. She's had so many good memories with them, apparently, is her explanation. I don't see how they could have been, there could have been that many good memories, given the fact that she's only known them for like two weeks or something along those lines. I don't even think it's been that long, actually, in the storyline. Uh, Timmy, of course, then states, you know, oh, well, you don't have a backup, you know, file to remember this stuff. And then she has to explain that, you know, regular human beings don't have that, which, again, doesn't really fit with anything. You know, I understand that Timmy's an android, but he's also supposed to be incredibly smart and, you know, well-programmed. So you would think that somehow he would probably know that, you know, organic humans or mutants don't have the ability to just back up all of their memories onto a hard drive. But... Somehow he's shown as being very ignorant of that in this case, which I guess is supposed to create some sort of sympathetic moment between the two, but it doesn't really work. It kind of falls flat because it doesn't make sense. Uh, the door then opens and some of the security members walk in and separate the two as they take Velocity away to have her mind wiped. And then they take Timmy to Mother May I. Uh, Velocity states that, you know, she's giving her final goodbye to Timmy and, you know, is sad that she'll probably never see him again. Timmy says, you know, I'll never forget you, Velocity, when she states, oh, it's Karen, my name is Karen. And then he states, I'll never forget you, Karen. And it's supposed to be a very touching moment, kind of, I guess. It's, again, how much of a bond could the two of these characters have formed in just a few days? We are then teleported back underground to the base that Mother May I has held up in with tons of other mutants as she basically you know, riles them up into a fever pitch and states that, you know, the revolution starts tonight. They're going to uh, go ahead with their plans of attack in, you know, basically holding the city of New York hostage to gain uh, their ability to form their own independent mutant nation. Uh, of course, Stryker is there alongside of Mother May I witnessing this as we see him think to himself that the FBI was correct in all of their assumptions as to what Mother May I's plans were and how organized she was. However, they were way off on the timeline and this is happening far faster than any of them had realized. Also, I'd like to point out, I didn't notice or I didn't say anything about this on the first page. Throughout the entirety of this comic, we get these little timestamps up at the top. And this is all supposed to be happening throughout Wednesday evening. Uh, this one here takes place at 849, where we see with uh, Velocity and Timmy. And this one over here takes place at 853. Now, I point that out to tell you that you can basically ignore it. Because apparently, Eric Silvestri can't count or keep up with, 
you know, what points of the story were happening at what times, and the time jumps all over the place in ways that it shouldn't be able to in order for the story to happen in the correct continuity, which we will see going forward. Meanwhile, back at the hideout slash base of operations for the Cyberforce team known as Subplex, it's now currently 9.05, according to Eric, and Stryker makes a call back to the team and explains to them what's happening. Uh, they ask if he's got his hands on the virus um, or how if he knows how it works. Uh, he states that Mother May I does have the ability to shut off the city's power grid, which, of course, would throw New York City into chaos over time. And that, you know, there is ways to get around it and whatnot and shut it down, but they don't have access to that right now. This, of course, is the disc that we saw Timmy swallow in, gosh, what was that? Issue number two. Yeah, issue number two. Um, so they're kind of oblivious to all that as they've had no real contact with Velocity or Timmy. And they're worried about, you know, what's going to go down when the lights go out. Uh, so they decide that it's time to mobilize. We, of course, see uh, Heat Wave and Cyblade pictured for the first time within the pages of Cyberforce without their masks on, which is kind of neat. Now, apparently, I don't have this issue, and I'm fine not having this issue because of what it is, but basically, uh, Cyblade was pictured without her mask in the Homage Studios swimsuit issue. Um... I don't have that. I have no interest in having it. I'm not a 12 year old boy. I don't need some swimsuit pinup issue of comic book characters. But if you're into that, go ahead, buy one. Maybe it's cool for you. Um, they decide to mobilize. Also, we noticed that the FBI agents that first approached Stryker about infiltrating Mother May I's uh, organization are still here in the Cyberforce headquarters. And this is it. This is the only time they're pictured. They're mentioned here by Cyblade. She states, oh yeah, they're still here, um, but they don't offer any aid in any way. I don't know why they're still here. I don't know why they are pretending like they're going to help when they have no intentions whatsoever of helping. It doesn't make any sense, but whatever. Also, the technology here doesn't make any sense. What's going on? I mean, the, all of their display screens are just nothing but random colored lights. Like, what are these, what are they even monitoring? What are they monitoring here? If they were just sitting around waiting for Stryker to get back to them, what on earth could they possibly do be doing that requires this many computers and weird handheld devices and screens of just gibberish lighting? <laughs> like, it doesn't, I'm sorry, I have a whole lot of problems with this, what all of this is, whatever it is. Meanwhile, back at Cybertata, uh, we see that Kamada is being contacted um, because of what's been going on with them. Apparently, another cyber data facility was broken into where a man fitting the description of Splitskrieg stole some broadcasting equipment. Uh, this, of course, is going to be used by the mutants to get their message across about their ransom and what their demands are. Uh, Kamada is a little bit worried that things are starting to go off script here and that he feels he's out of the loop as he believes that, you know, Mother May I should be keeping him abreast of everything that she's doing and what her plans are. Uh, also dealing with the fact that he's worried about her not living up to her end of the bargain when he's clearly in love with her and is dealing with having to get past those feelings and also answer to the higher ups at cyber data. It's a real conundrum for him. And at this point, we're not entirely sure where his loyalties lie. On the next page, we see that Kamada decides he needs to check in on mother. May I with one of the apparently hidden cameras that's installed in her secret base, which may or may not have been built by cyber data. We have no idea because it's not been established at any point. Uh, when he turns on the video screen, which is a giant screen that we see here that would have made sense in Cyber Force's hideout as well, but they don't have anything like this apparently. Uh, also, he still has a lot of the gibberish colored light panels that I, who knows what those are doing. He turns it on. He has his, 
hidden camera focused directly on Mother May I's bed, because apparently he's also a huge pervert, and finds that she is in the arms of Stryker as the two of them kiss passionately, and he becomes instantly enraged. Also, the whole idea of Stryker now apparently sleeping with Mother May I doesn't make the most sense. Uh, I mean, yes, as a double agent, he does need to gain her trust. However, he's already saved her life at this point, so there's no reason for him to go to this length other than the fact that he's just trying to get laid, apparently. Uh, Kamada, of course, is thrown into a rage instantly. Uh, he was in love with Mother May I, and seeing her in the arms of another man is something that he just can't tolerate. However, he's interrupted when a call comes through from none other than the shadowy figure Zadrock. Now, we don't know much about Zadrock at this point. Uh, he is someone that Kamada answers to and apparently has supreme authority over Kamada. But outside of that, we don't know much about his character. Uh, he mocks Kamada for letting his emotions get out of control and tells him, you know, you're acting like a child in school who's lost his girlfriend. He's like, you need to be focused on the situation at hand. He's like basically saying that, you know, you need to be focused on cyber data and what is going on to protect cyber data and its interests and, you know, not be worried about whether or not some woman who doesn't even share the feelings for you that you have for her is in the arms of someone else. Kamada realizes that Zadrock is correct and starts a plan in motion to get the cyber data facility ready for the upcoming events. In another part of the cyberdata facility, we see a door open and Timmy peek his head around. Now, apparently, Timmy has some sort of electric assault weapon built into his body that we didn't know about until just this moment. And he could have at any time used this to potentially aid in the escape of himself and Velocity, but chose not to for, again, reasons we don't understand. Also, I'd like to point out that it's now currently 6.31 p.m., so we've jumped back in time for no apparent reason other than the fact that Eric Silvestri can't count. Uh, because none of these events are in chronological order now because we saw earlier that when Timmy and Velocity were separated, it was already after 8 o'clock and now it's somehow two hours before that. Or an hour and a half before that. So why? how could you not keep up with that? If this was such an integral part of the story you were trying to tell and you would go to the trouble of putting these, you know, little bubbles up at the top of almost every single page of this issue and then somehow get the time wrong on them, it just doesn't make any sense. Like, why would you do that? Uh, of course, Velocity is strapped down as they're apparently getting ready to do the mind wipe. Uh, Killjoy is there as apparently just to be a villainous presence because she wasn't the one who led Velocity away and continues to taunt Velocity stating that, you know, this is going to hurt, but it's not going to matter because you won't remember it anyway. Uh, Timmy then uses his abilities to hack into the cyber data system and take control of the power grid inside of the building just as Velocity is being given the sedative for the mind wipe. And then suddenly everything goes black as Timmy kills the power. Meanwhile, outside of the Cyberdata building, we see that the Cyberforce team is on their way to try and aid Velocity and Timmy and save them and stop the plans of Mother May I. Unfortunately, they should be way too late, but of course they're not because it's just Eric Silvestri messing up the time because it's now suddenly 11.30 which I might be willing to buy that that was the case, that they just jumped five hours ahead in time, except that once we get back into the building, we see that we're in exactly the same place we were on the previous page that took place five hours before, where the lights have just been turned off, the doctor who was about to perform the mind wipe on Velocity shouts at Killjoy to get the emergency power up and running, and Velocity tries to make her escape. Killjoy is upset about this, stating we've got to get her. However, the doctor reassures her that you know, she's been heavily sedated. She won't get far. We see that Velocity is very much fighting the effects of the anesthesia as she is stumbling around, uh, doing her best to remain conscious, trying to figure out how she's going to make it out of the building when she is suddenly grabbed as someone puts their hand over her mouth. Meanwhile, in another part of the city, we see that Mother May I and the mutants under her charge have, 
used the equipment stolen by Splitskrieg to take over the broadcasting systems in New York and broadcast their message to the entire city. As Mother May I states that she's actually quite sad about the fact that they're going to destroy most of the city and you know, especially the fact that the Statue of Liberty may be destroyed, as we saw earlier, she has a real affinity for that statue. But she then states to the populace of New York City that there are so many things they take for granted, especially the infrastructure like the water and sewers and electricity. And what would happen to them and the city that they love if all of those things were to suddenly be taken away as we're then apparently teleported to the building where they monitor these systems and one of the men asks what's about to happen and the other responds it's the end of the world for the city of new york not so much the rest of the world but <laughs> apparently they know what's going on as they see everything going down there should have been some sort of little thing here indicating that that's the place that they were at you know the city center where all this is monitored because it we're kind of just left to assume that's the case also the point at which all of this is supposed to be taking place, where Mother May I is turning off the power to the city, is apparently at 6.59 p.m. Again, times all over the place. This is supposed to be happening at roughly the same time as this, not, you know, five hours earlier. And if it was happening five hours earlier, then the whole city that we see in this panel, which is all lit up, would not be lit up. Come on, Eric, what were you doing here, buddy? Outside of the Cyberdata building, the Cyberforce team has finally arrived. We see Heatwave, Impact, and Chip begin their assault at the ground level. Uh, Chip is outfitted with some sort of high-tech armor and large laser gun. And then we see from the sky, uh, Ripclaw and Cyblade jumping out of their not X-Jet to attack from the rooftop of the building which doesn't really make any sense given the fact that Heatwave is the only member of the team who can fly. Why would he not have been one of the people in the jet jumping onto the rooftop? Seems like that would have made more sense to me anyway. Uh, also, we find out at this point that Heatwave was a former or is a former U.S. Navy SEAL. And he believes that his training is going to be really important to getting Velocity and Timmy out of this alive and also saving the city. At the same time, we see a train running underground. This is not part of the New York subway system, however. This is a train that was apparently built by Cyberdata that Mother May I can use to traverse from her base to the Cyberdata building, which does lead us to believe that her hideout was in fact built by Cyberdata, but again, that was never established. Uh, Stryker states that it's pretty impressive she has her own train. She explains that it's not hers, it does belong to Cyberdata, but that it's very useful in instances like this where she needs to get to the Cyberdata building in a hurry. Outside of the Cyberdata building, once again, we see that Impact Heatwave and Chip are approaching the door to the building, but are quite surprised about the fact that they haven't met any resistance and are wondering what's going on here, that there's no security. And Impact even states, you know, hey, maybe this is going to be easier than we thought. Unfortunately, they don't seem to notice the large contingent of Cyber Force security commandos descending on them. Uh, on the rooftop, we see that Cyblade is also hopeful that maybe they will be able to get into the building with no real resistance. However, she's interrupted when Ripclaw states that it's a setup, that he can smell that something is wrong. And she's like, oh, are you sure? And he's like, I'm positive, as we see him look ominously out of this frame directly at us. We then see that it was none other than Buzzcut and a large contingency of security commandos on the rooftop who have now gotten the drop on Ripclaw and Cyblade. Uh, Buzzcut immediately starts to taunt Ripclaw as Ripclaw returns the banter. Once again, these two are apparently arch enemies. They hate each other with a visceral passion, although we still don't know why. Uh, you know, it's constantly brought up that the two of these characters are at you know complete odds with one another and that they have a real disdain for each other but 
we have no explanation as to what the backstory on that is. And I feel like it should have been given at some point throughout the miniseries. But for whatever reason, Eric decided not to write that part in. We see that Ripclaw once again gets himself ready for battle. Uh, this right here is cool because it actually shows that his hands can be transformed into the giant claw blade fingers that he uses for battle. And that when he's not fighting, that they're basically just like normal fingers. I don't know if this is achieved through some sort of nanotech, uh, similar to what we see with the likes of Super Patriot in Savage Dragon. Um, it's never really explained, but I can probably assume, I think it's safe to probably assume that it's something along those lines. As we see then that Ripclaw focuses his gaze on Buzzcut as the battle is about to get underway and he knows he's in for a real fight as Buzzcut has had a few upgrades since their last fight in, what was it, issue number two, I believe? Meanwhile, back on ground level, the battle is really heating up as we see that Impact, Heatwave, and Chip have been surrounded by the forces of Cyberdata. Uh, the commando's unleashing. Uh, we do see that, you know, Impact is using his body to shield some of the incoming fire, uh, really taking a point to um, emphasize how strong and thick his armor is. Uh, we also see that Heatwave and Chip are returning fire. Heatwave stating that if they just remain calm and stay together, they should be able to dispatch all of these troops pretty easily. However, Chip turns around and realizes that they're in for a lot more trouble as they're being flanked by none other than Killjoy, Psychotron, and Megawatt. Also, I don't understand how, you know, Psychotron and Megawatt are able to keep up with Killjoy given that she's supposed to have super speed. Uh, she runs by Chip, smacking him aside in the process, hitting him so hard that it knocks his helmet off, taunting him as she does so. And we see he Heatwave turn his gaze to her and, you know, essentially just say that, you know, he really can't believe how much she just seems to enjoy being as evil as she is. We then get an advertisement for Bow and Board advertising some pit number two ash cans for $15 each. Holy crap, that was a really steep price in 1993. Uh, we also get an image of Pitt behind the advertisement standing in front of the moon. That's a pretty cool image. I like it. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Pitt, feel free to check out my Pitt playlist. Getting back into the story, we are now inside of the chief executive offices of Cyberdata, aka Kamada's office, as he asks how the battle is going. He's informed that there's heavy fighting both on the roof and at the ground level, and he then states that their satellites are being jammed by the mutants, as apparently the equipment stolen by Splitzkrieg is more than enough to jam high-level technological satellites. It didn't look like it. I mean, the stuff that was in the room that we saw with Mother May I doing the broadcast basically just looked like some standard broadcasting and recording equipment, but apparently it's also satellite jamming equipment. It's at this point that Mother May I makes her grand entrance as she starts to taunt Kamada and is upset that he sold them out and allowed for the housing projects to be taken over through corporate interest. He tries to cover saying that, you know, that was made by a decision or that decision was made by, you know, higher level executives in cyber data than him. And he really had no control over it. Uh, to which mother may I says, Oh, speaking of control, I don't think I've ever shown you exactly how far my uh, mind control abilities can go and what exactly I can make you do. And she starts to approach Kamada she is then interrupted by none other than Ballistic, who has Velocity in her grasp with a gun pointed at her head. Uh, at this point, Kamada has realized that Velocity has some level of importance to Mother May I and believes that he can use her to his advantage. As Ballistic states, you know, this girl means something to you, so how about we all just settle down and you tell us exactly what you're up to before the girl gets hurt. Meanwhile, on the rooftop, as the battle rages on, we see that Buzzcut and Ripclaw are fighting tooth and nail against each other. Uh, Ripclaw, in his inner monologue, realizes that Buzzcut's uh, upgrades have been very significant since their last battle, and that he's now much faster and has a much higher level of stamina than he did before. 
And Ripcola realizes that if this battle becomes prolonged, he's going to be in some real trouble and that he needs to end it quickly so that he's not killed by the man he's sworn to kill himself. Uh, on another part of the rooftop, we see that Sideblade is engaging with the rest of all of the troops on her own because of Ripclaw being so preoccupied with Buzzcut. She's worried about how long she can hold out and is also worried about for the safety of Ripclaw as she understands that Buzzcut will not hesitate to kill him and that he seems to be stronger than he's ever been at this point. And they're starting to doubt how well this fight is going and whether or not they're going to be able to save their friends and themselves. Back down at the street level, we see that Impact is fighting his way through the troops and he asks if Chip is okay. Heatwave responds that yes, he is and that he's going after Killjoy. However, he's interrupted by Psychotron, who decides to press his own attack on Heatwave, unleashing a blast of energy in Heatwave's direction. Heatwave returns this a blast with a blast of his own as we see the energy in the middle of them starting to increase. Heatwave then yells at Psychotron for attacking him, telling him using energy attacks at such close range are basically suicidal and that he shouldn't be doing this. Uh, Psychotron just shrugs it off, stating, you know, I'm going to show you that, you know, I know what I'm doing. I'm going to take you out. And Heatwave just continues to inch forward, getting closer and closer until finally both of their attacks overload into a huge explosion. Kaboom. The explosion was so significant that it apparently knocked everybody out of the fight as we see Psychotron lying unconscious and Heatwave even having to gather himself as he picks himself up off the ground. Uh, Impact was apparently thrown underneath some rubble as we see a bunch of debris on his back and Chip is coming out to see if everyone's okay. Uh, they look around and notice that all of the security forces, along with Killjoy, are now unconscious. Who knows what the hell even happened to Megawatt because we haven't seen him since he first made his charge in with Killjoy and Psychotron. Maybe he's dead. Maybe he was knocked out. Maybe he just left. Nobody knows. Uh, back on the rooftop, uh, now at 7.28 p.m., as if any of that matters, we see that Buzzcut and Ripclaw are still going toe-to-toe -to -toe with each other, neither one of the, them really being able to gain an upper hand on the other. Buzzcut has Ripclaw backed up to the edge of the rooftop, and believes that he has the upper hand as he charges forward, taunting Ripclaw, stating, here comes the best part. And Ripclaw states, oh, you mean the part where you're really off balance and top heavy? As he ducks under him and Buzzcut flies off of the rooftop, apparently falling to his death as we see a silhouette of him against the skyline as he's falling off the top of this enormous skyscraper. And, you know, Ripclaw just taunts him and is like, hey, man, you know, uh, it doesn't look good for cyber data and it doesn't look good for you. You may want to sell some of your stock. Uh, back inside of the building, we see that a bunch of people have their guns drawn on Mother May I as Kamada tells them to open fire and take her out. However, it's at this point that we see Stryker burst in and open fire on all of the cyber data forces. Uh, we then see Ballistic return fire stating that everyone needs to focus their attack on Stryker. Stryker, of course, realizes that he's completely outgunned in this scenario, despite the fact that he has four pistols and four arms to use them with, and decides that he has to take cover and that also he's through with blondes, which is kind of speaking to the point of how uh, Stryker is a bit of a womanizer. Uh, it's not brought up a lot throughout this miniseries, but it's brought up enough to point out that this is indeed one of his character traits. As Ballistic continues to put down suppressing fire, we see Stryker take cover behind a wall. Uh, even though the wall doesn't seem to be a match for the gun that Ballistic is using because we see holes punching directly above Stryker's head and it seems like this is somewhere he should not be. Uh, also, we then see that Kamada realizes that Mother May I is distracted, so he pulls a gun out from inside of his jacket and unloads said gun into her back. Uh, we then see that Mother May I is bleeding, but she's not dead yet, and she turns around and begins to use her mind control powers to make Kamada put the gun up to his temple. And then states, you know, 
we should be together forever, and I'm going to make sure that you follow me to hell, essentially. Uh, as he begs her to stop, we then see the click as he pulls the trigger, and then he begins to taunt Mother May I because his gun is empty, and he states, gee, I wonder where my bullets are at. Oh, never mind. I could tell by the look on your face, you know exactly where all of them are, which admittedly is something pretty cold to say to someone that you just unloaded your entire gun into. We then see that Ballistic orders Stryker to put down his weapons and give up, so, or if he wants to keep Velocity safe. However, they're interrupted by one of the random security force members who's also involved in all this, who states that that order is no longer viable and that he's been given orders to terminate every unauthorized personnel within the building. As we see Stryker turn around just in time to see this security officer fire a grenade at everyone inside of the room and Stryker says, take cover, grenade. The grenade explodes, causing a huge blast that throws everybody across the room. The blast is so powerful that it actually shoots Kamada straight through the window as he then assumedly falls to his death as we see him flying through the air and falling down towards the pavement. As we also see Ballistic knocked unconscious, but fall back into a sequence that seems very similar to the one that we saw earlier, where she is inside of the same home along with Velocity. And that's because it turns out that Ballistic is actually Cassie, who is Velocity's older sister. And that Mother May I was apparently their mom the whole time. As we see that she turns around and basically states that you know, she's not going to help either Karen or Cassie and just stably states goodbye to both of them uh, because she's the one who tried to destroy the, you know, children's home that they were staying in and killed the both of them along with everyone else who was in the building. We then see that Velocity tries to pull Cassie out from underneath the rubble stating, we've got to get out of here. I'll help you. Uh, Cassie tries to tell her that, you know, we she can't do it. She can't get free. And just then she wakes back up and realizes that she's hanging off the side of the building and being held by none other, none other than Velocity again in an eerily similar position where she's about to fall to her doom and Velocity's trying to save her. However, the rubble of the building isn't secure enough to hold the both of them and Velocity is being pulled out of the building along with her. She screams at Velocity to let her go. She doesn't want to see her sister die as all of her memories start to return to her. However, Velocity states, I'm not going to let you go. I just got you back. And as we see the two of them fall out of the building, Velocity just screams, I love you. However, just in the nick of the time, Velocity's ankle is grabbed by none other than Stryker, who apparently, although hanging from the same rubble that Velocity was just hanging from, is secure enough that he can hold not only the two of their weights, but his own, and tells them both to hold still and that no one lets go of anyone until he gets them back inside of the building. Once back in the building, Ballistic goes to Mother May I, who is a dying from her gunshot wounds, and states, you know, Mother, please don't move. Uh, Mother May I realizes that both of her daughters now realize who she is, and starts to explain to them what happened. Apparently, she was caught by cyber data and locked up and experimented on by them. Uh, they then said to her that she would never be able to see her daughters again. She was able to break out, but then apparently got drunk, went nuts, and started acting crazy and decided that if she couldn't have her daughters, nobody would. So she planned on killing them both by setting their foster home or orphanage on fire and killing not only them, but everyone else inside. And then with her dying breath, she says, I'm sorry. Uh, Ballistic then tells Stryker and Velocity to get out and rejoin their friends as we then are teleported back to Subplex where the team is all together again, trying to revel in their victory. However, Timmy's very upset, you know, still depressed. They ask what's wrong. And Trip says that, He's pretty sure he knows what'll cheer him up as he brings back a completely rebuilt and functional CC. Uh, Timmy's super happy to see his animatronic cat buddy safe again. CC asks if he missed anything. The rest of the team states, oh, there was nothing much, just a kidnapping and a car bomb and a biker from another planet. And then all the lights in New York City got knocked out. But, you know, 
other than that, nothing much. And that's the end of the story. It's not... I have so many problems with this, but I'm not going to get to it just yet. Instead, we're going to talk about the preview of Codename Strike Force, which is written by Mark Silvestri, pencils by Brandon Peterson, inks by Mark Silvestri, colors by Joe Chiodo, letters Mike Heisler, and color separation in color. By the way, this is coming out in August of 1993, so don't go looking for it on shelves this August. We are then teleported to a plane of some sort of high-tech origin that is flying to a drop point for the Strike Force team. The pilot, whose name we never learn, uh, tells the team inside that the moment they leave the plane, they're going to be visible to radar, so they need to hit the ground quickly. She also has an eye patch for some reason. Uh, Striker then, you know, says, you know, heads up. We heard or we get the message. Everybody get to the ground ASAP as the rest of the team already has their objectives known, and he states in his inner monologue that he doesn't need to go into deep description about what each person's job is. Uh, the first character that we see exit the plane is a man by the name of Bloodbow, who is yet another archery-based character in Image Comics. Uh, he apparently is very headstrong and always wants to be the first into battle, which is why he jumps out of the plane immediately. He's followed by Tempest, who apparently has wind control powers. Uh, Striker, once again, following into his character trait of being a womanizer, says, Hey, babe, don't break a nail. She states that if anything gets broken tonight, it's going to be his jaw. And is in, in his inner monologue, he just says to himself, Oh, she's crazy about me. Kind of just living in this delusional state where any attractive woman around wants to be with him. We're then introduced to the greatest character that Mark Silvestri ever created in his entire career. Of course, I'm talking about Killraiser, who, as we see, has two big blades pop out of his forearms for no reason at this point, because he's just jumping out of the plane. There's no battle to be had in midair. But Stryker states in his inner monologue that, you know, Killraiser is a man of few words and has the ability to grow these blades out of any part of his body, which looks painful. And that the only reason, the only way that you could ever beat him is to kill him. And obviously he's never lost a fight. The last member out of the plane is none other than Black Anvil, who we see lighting a cigar as he steps up to the opening. Stryker states, you know, those are going to kill you one day. And Black Anvil just responds by saying, if they do, they'll be the only thing that can as he jumps out of the plane with no parachute, because apparently he has super strength and endurance, I would assume. Uh, and Stryker states it's because he likes to make a big impact when he lands. As Stryker stands next to the opening of the plane, the pilot states to him that, you know, this is going to be a tricky one and to watch his ass. Um, Stryker responds, of course, in the most, you know, macho way possible, stating... If I'm washing my ass, then we'll both be looking at it. She says, don't flatter yourself and be back at 1700 hours. He states, don't be late this time as he jumps out of the plane, stating in his inner monologue that there's 130 heavily armed men down on the ground waiting for them and that there's only five people in his team, which means that it's really bad odds for them because it's got to end in the most edgelord way possible. And that's our introduction to Strike Force. Don't get worried or don't be worried, folks. I have several issues of Codename Strike Force, maybe most of the series, and I'll definitely do some videos on it, but this is our first introduction to it. On the last page of the issue, we get an advertisement for the ongoing Cyber Force monthly series that will be upcoming. Uh, don't get, don't worry about that as well. Uh, I have quite a few issues of that. I don't know if I have the entire series, but probably most of it, if I'm being honest. And I'll definitely be making videos about that in the future. Then we get to Subscriber Force, which is admittedly a pretty creative name for the letter section. Most of these letters aren't really that memorable. They're basically just people praising Mark Silvestri for his book, saying how great it is, how unique it is, even though it's really not that unique because it's basically just a copy of X-Men. But that being said, there are quite a few that complement the writing and I feel that's because they haven't been able to read this issue when they were writing these letters. Because this issue, well, the writing's not that great as we saw, and I'm about to talk about in just a second. 
And that was Cyber Force number four. And I gotta say, I am not a fan of this issue. Uh, you know, I overall, I enjoy Cyber Force. And despite the fact that it is very obviously a not thinly veiled copy of X-Men, I feel like it's different enough that it does stand on its own as a fun comic to read. But man, this issue just kind of drops the ball in a lot of ways for me. The whole thing about, you know, the timestamps being completely wrong throughout the entire issue. I don't even know how you make a mistake like that. That's just ridiculous. And then also the fact that, you know, within the span of one page, they drop all these plot bombshells of, Oh, by the way, you know, Velocity and Ballistic are sisters, and Mother Maya is their mom, and she tried to murder them as kids because she went into a drunken psychosis and all this other stuff. Like, why would you try to drop all of that on a single page of one issue of a comic book? You could have drawn that out into a long play story that would have had way bigger payoffs down the line, and you could have used that for a lot of character development and it really just feels wasted in this instance. You know, also, you've got characters that feel like they should have lasted longer, like Kamada. And, you know, I understand the Cyber Data team, they can be rebuilt. So it's not like they're necessarily dead. But Kamada's almost certainly dead. The guy just fell from the top of like a hundred story building or whatever. But like I said, it's just. I don't know. It, there's so much in this book that just feels rushed and so much story. They just tried to cram in all in one issue. And it's super confusing to read in a lot of points, you know, almost to the extent of what we saw with some of the issues of the Wildcats miniseries, where it just, there's so much, you know, clutter in dialogue and, so much jumping around from one location to another location and, you know, from just one page to the next. And it just doesn't flow well and it doesn't read easily. And a lot of it seems unnecessarily convoluted. Also, you know, despite the fact that learning Mother May, Mother May I was her mom and that she just died, Velocity sure didn't seem all that upset about it when she was back at Subplex. It's just, I don't know. It's just weird. But again, that falls into the idea that Velocity was, you know, mourning the fact that she was going to lose all of her memories about the Cyber Force team and Timmy and being like, oh, no, you guys mean so much to me. We've known each other for like eight days. But then, you know, to not even shed a tear at the fact that her mom just got killed, it doesn't even seem to make sense for her character. But once again, these are all just my opinions. And if you don't agree with them, that's OK. You might think that this was an amazing way to end the series and that this was one of the best comics you ever read. And if so, it's fine because everybody's entitled to their own opinion. If you enjoyed today's video, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And thanks for stopping by. Have a great day.